Hello everyone, and welcome to the latest Beatles News Briefs Extra. I'm Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard, Variety, and Goldmine, and also moderator of the Facebook Beatle News and Information Group. And this edition is dated November 22, 2018. On today's show, we have a special interview with veteran Beatles author Brian Southall. But first, a little bit of Beatles news. We have a chart update for you. Uh, normally, the chart mentions are few, but with the release of the White Album 2018 mix, the Billboard chart for the week of November 24th had a lot of references to the Beatles. The White Album chart atop the catalog's uh, albums chart at number one. Abbey Road also re-entered the chart at number 41. On the Billboard Top 200 albums, the White Album uh, re-entered at number 6. Abbey Road is number 164, up from 183 the previous week, and Beatles 1 is 185, down from 177. On the Digital Albums chart, the White Album re-enters at number 16. On the Vinyl Albums chart, Abbey Road is number 15, down from number 10. On the Top 100 Artists, the Beatles placed at number 10. On the top rock albums for the week of November 24th, the White Album is number 2. Abbey Road is number 30, up from 32 the previous week, and Beatles 1 is number 35, down from number 31. Be sure to check out contributing editor Candy Leonard's essay on being thankful for the White Album that's now available on culturesonar.com. And here's our extra for this episode. We recently talked to veteran author and journalist... Brian Southall, who's done many music books, including several Beatle books and a, the definitive history of the Abbey Road Studios. We talked to him about his new book on the White Album called The White Album Revolution, Politics, and Recording the Beatles in the World in 1968, which is a musical history and a cultural history of the White Album. And we really enjoyed talking with him. His history not only includes as an author, but he also worked at EMI for some time. And he talks about both uh, working as an author and working at EMI in this very candid interview, which I think you'll find fascinating. We'll continue the show with our looking back in history at the conclusion of the interview. Here we go. Your book uh, uh, actually takes kind of an interesting view in that you look at the al- the White Album not only as music, but you also look at it as cultural history. Why did you Why did you do it this way? Well, because there was one the the, the the book I did the previous year, nineteen last year, mm-hmm. uh, which was a similar theory, which was the fiftieth anniversary of Sergeant Pepper, mm-hmm. which was done uh, and nineteen sixty seven, and that was the, that was done in the same way, and that was where we sort of started the idea with the, with the publishers, whether it's an ongoing concept of. Not not Beatles albums and years because obviously we run out eventually. Mm-hmm. But whether we whether there is a another album and another year for 2020 or 2021 is it's 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 up for conversation. But the the idea was I went to the publishers and said you know Sergeant Pepper's 50 years you know should be something there'll be something out there you should consider doing something. So we sat down and talked about it and came up with this idea of. The A side, the B side, the the out uh, of an album. If you're old enough to remember an album, and the A side being the record um, in all its glory, the cover, the reception, and you know talking to people who were there and involved, and so on, and people who bought it and fans, and then the B side being the year and what happened and what made in socially in terms of politics sport whatever which was a sort of you know i, I think a, a unique way of doing it um and then we moved on to do, to do the same thing when we did sergeant pepper i don't think the plan was necessarily to do the white album in 68 but um it seemed to have been well received and uh, the idea was that we, you know they came to me and said do we want to do the White Album and 68? Um, so that's where the, the the whole idea came from, and this one carries on that idea of the A side being the record and the B side being the year and the news and the events that took place, which was which is the, the most fascinating part of it. I mean, I you know I was a fan of the records and I bought them in in the, in the 60s, but it's amazing what you forget. Uh, <laughs> I was 
I mean, 20, 1968, the White Album came out, I was 21. And you forget, you know, what's, what went on all that time ago. Uh, you remember what happened to you, your, you know, personal memories, but all the stuff that went on around it. Uh, and that, well, that was sort of quite fascinating uh, to, to go back and, and look back over that and, and talk to people and, who were there, not just involved in the album and the music business, but were just, you know, around. They were doing whatever they were doing at school or college or whatever they were doing to get their memories and, and uh, you know, uh, anecdotes of, of, of the year. So that's sort of where it came from. Mm-hmm. I mean, in some way, of course, just to say, in some way, each of the records, besides Pepper, you know, Psychedelia, they, you know, are the, the product of, of their time. And, and uh, the White Album, too, with, with the th- you know, things like Revolution and various other things, various other tracks. They, you know, they are a product of their time as well. Um, which is which, which also hopefully will come out, you know, in in the book. Was was the album and the and the and the history was it different for British fans? Because your book is really um, heavily weighted, I think, to a British perspective. Was it, it? I mean, do you do you agree with that? And is it was it more? Was it different for American fans versus the British fans? So it's different for Americans in what way? Sorry. Well, in, in the cultural the cultural aspect that, that you talk about in the book, is it was it different from them and versus the Americans or? What know? from a musical point of view, or just the news and the events that were going on? Well, okay, a little yeah, a little of both, yeah. Well, well the rebel, you know, the, the revolutions and the and the you know we we've got on the front that it was revolution politics and recording. You know, uh, you, and America was was rife with uh, with protest. Um, uh, issues of uh, racial segregation, uh, the Vietnam War. There was a lot of protests going on there, which and 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 you know, and only a year after we'd sort of supposedly have uh, love, peace, and harmony, uh, which didn't last that long, seemingly. And those protests took place. You know, there were protests were repeated all around Europe. It was an extraordinary year, not not to do with the issues of. Uh, of race, or to do some with the Vietnam War in, in London, particularly there were you know big rallies about the Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War here in London. But you know the, the, the France had a million people on strike over the policies of their government, and Germany's students were were up in arms about s- certain aspects of their government. So I think you know the, the, there was a, a feeling within the people, if you like, on on both sides of the Atlantic, that th- th- this was a year of change, and the only way to perhaps get that change was to, you know, take to the streets. It, it was a, 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 an extraordinary... Or even though I don't think the people here or the people there necessarily knew what each of them were doing on either side of the Atlantic. You know, it wasn't a multimedia time. It was, mm-hmm. you know, we read about it in the newspapers probably a day or two days after. It might have been a little bit on the news if we bothered to watch the news as teenagers or youngsters. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't in your face and all over the place and easy, easily accessible. So um, I, th- I think there was a... It was just a, a feeling of, of, of uprising, or if, if you wanted to get something done, you know, you had to go out and and force people's hands and make your feelings known. And some, you know, some won, some some lost. You know, the the, the Vietnam War did end, but it didn't end at the time. Uh, the French government protest was bizarrely against the President de Gaulle, who you know, secretly left France to avoid a million people who were sort of, you know, screaming for blood, and three months later they voted him back into power. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, you know, the American issue with with uh, racial segregation, you know, has gone on and continued to go on after many years after 1968. Um, it, but it just came to with the black power movement and stuff like that. So I think it was, and, you know, one has to, Assume you know the Beatles at this time now are fully grown up adults. You know they're in their late twenties. They're not the Fab Four anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know they some of them got kids. They're all married. They're all they're in relationships. They're grown ups and presumably aware of what is going on and how they deal with it. And you know they went off to India with one part of that sort of love and peace and the Maharishi to find something over there and. As it turned out, you know, found themselves fairly bored, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> without any uh, any uh, substances legal or illegal, and you know, alcohol or or uh, tobacco or anything else, 
um, and ended up sort of writing a whole album, whether out of you know inspiration, boredom, I don't know. But it was uh, that was one way of them dealing with the issues of the time. Other people, and you know, it's interesting. You know, the, the famous song "Revolution" as John Lennon saying, "Count me in, count me out, count me in out." You know, uh, couldn't make up his mind whether he was wanted to be part of or encourage a revolution. So um, I think. Yeah, the, the the book is you know, the Beatles were English, are English. You know, I am in England. The publishers are English, mm-hmm. um, so it obviously had that sort of slant on it. Um, but you know, we tried to represent things that were going on around the world. But uh, um, and it was, of course, only the second album I think after sergeant pepper that was released around the world on on the same day around the world and with the same format and the same cover and so on and so forth so in that respect everybody got the same thing on the same day um which was something they've been striving for for years and only eventually succeeded with uh, with sergeant pepper first of all have you heard the new mix at all have you gone to any of the have, i know they've had Listening no, sessions no. there. Oh, okay. Funny enough, I did an interview in in London this this week on this, and, and this this subject was brought up then, and it's one of the and and I was sort of explaining that I'm I'm you know I have what I have I you know I have the Beatles albums as I bought them in the sixties in their original form, and I have got the CDs and the you know and since they've come out and so on and so forth. But I'm never entirely convinced that I want to go through take 143 and, you know, that was rejected. And it may well be for sort of audio files. It may be for, you know, true Beatle fanatics more so than me. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a fan of the music that they released. I bought the music they released. I enjoyed it. I don't, I did, you know, having worked at EMI and, and, and work with Mark, I mean, Mark Lewison's book, The Complete Beatles recording session was a book I was going to write. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, it was a book that was produced within EMI. It's an EMI book, and I was uh, had had written books, and I was going to write that book. Um, I then had a car accident, and uh, which required some serious surgery on on my back, and a, a, and, a, and in those days a fairly lengthy recuperation. Um, uh, <laughs> and lying on your back is not a good way to type. Um, <laughs> So I called up Mark and asked Mark to end a deal with Mark for him to write it. Um, and I, in fact, edited the book while lying sort of prone in my hospital bed or here. Um, so yeah, I had access and, and, and John Barrett, who, who sadly died, who worked at Abbey Road and went through, uh, before that book came out, John Barrett, mm-hmm. who was sadly diagnosed with, with terminal cancer, uh, but didn't want to stay at home. He wanted to come in so ken townsend sort of gave him the job of for the first time going through all the tapes that we had of the beatles that we knew we had didn't know we had uh and logging them and and listening to them and so on and so forth um uh which was sort of quite fascinating but it, that gave you an insight and in, an insight into what was was never released shouldn't have been released <laughs> was never going to be released mm-hmm. you know we tried to put out an album called uh, sessions um uh, which they the beatles uh successfully applied for an injunction for it to, to stop it being released which you know was was disappointing because it wasn't a uh, an album that was um uh, going to do them any great harm but I, that, that was their choice and they, and they won the case and the album was shelved they all, they all of tracks subsequently came out on the BBC things and the anthology things so. but when you heard those things that were demos or guide tracks or unfinished or whatever else but, you know there was an element of I know why it didn't come out I know why it shouldn't have come out and I you know when you hear you know take 73 of whatever it is thinking really do I need and I'm not convinced I need to hear all those things or I'm a great fan of hearing those things um it's you know it's just my view we had this conversation yesterday and um the engineer in the studio was keen to listen to everything because he's an engineer and he wasn't he wasn't necessarily interested in the I suppose he was interested in the comparison things that they did you know oh that, that's been tweaked or that you know from a technical point of view it wasn't the end product um, so yeah I, I, I'm, I'm I suppose I'm I'm a 
I'm a reluctant listener to uh, stuff that uh, wasn't released. They chose as a band not to release it for various reasons. It wasn't the take that they they chose to go with or whatever. Um, it's you know it's just a personal view that uh, I'm happy to run with that and go with you know what did come out. I mean I've heard tracks that they finished. Uh, things like How Do You Do It, obviously, which you know, which we had at EMI, and they never released as a single at the time, but they finished it. I've heard their, uh, obviously heard their demo tapes that they did, and the first things they did in Abbey Road in 62, and you sort of think, really, would you have signed them? I don't know, it's interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I had some sort of insight, but I, I'm I'm more inclined to go with the, uh, the, the final finished polished. I'm not a version, I'm not a great collector of, you know, I don't need any more Bob Dylan outtakes of to put a can, t- or whatever. You know, I don't. You know, there comes a point where you go, no, I've got what I want, and and I'm happy with that. So thank you. So no, I haven't been invited to any of them, and I and I on that <laughs> after that, I probably shan't be. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to if I talk to Giles next week, I'll ask him. Uh, I'm certainly not spending a hundred and whatever pounds it's going to be to get, uh, you know, whether it be Dark Side of the Moon or Sergeant Pepper or the White Album. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't fascinate me that much. I have to say. Well then, the album itself. If we go back to the yeah. to the uh, the album itself, and one of the things that they've been pushing, and actually it's not really a new quote, but it, it's out there now, is that it was a group album and not the individual album that that writers have always called it. How do you feel about that? Is it do you see it as a group album or do you see it as uh, an album where the four of them were trying their individuality? I think without question they're trying their individuality. I'm not, I, you know, I, I know whether that's something that is that is that a thing that Apple is putting forward or as a proposal or that that it was a group album that's coming from Apple. Well, there's, I mean, there's various yeah. quotes Ringo said at the time that yeah. that they were a band. You have quotes in the in your book that yeah. say yeah, no, no. I, I think without question that it was. It, it's it's probably a bit about there was always going to be a time when. They would, you know, Lennon would throw something into a McCartney song, and McCartney would throw something into a Lennon song, and maybe the two of them would throw something into a George song. Or that, that, that was, you know, you couldn't be together or not together, but you couldn't be that close to it without actually having, you know, throwing in something because that was the nature of of the Beatles up to that point um, had always been, you know, the idea that everything was worked as a Lennon-McCartney song we know to be, you know, completely untrue and that they were, many of them were individual songs and, you know, which other people contributed to or in some cases contributed nothing to. Um, so I think there was an there was undoubtedly some, some um, group involvement in this stuff in various tracks, some tracks. But from talking to people who were in the studio and working on this stuff, um, you know, the, it was unquestionable, there's no doubt that, that these, some of these people went off uh, and did what they wanted to do on their own. Um, well, I, I think it was the, the idea that, you know, that they were still a group is, is, is true and valid, and it was interesting that um, two people said to me exactly the same thing that it was whoever's track it was it was them and a backing band so it was john lennon and a backing band and the backing band happened to be the three other beatles or it's paul mccartney and a backing band. So they did you know they did record a lot of this stuff together uh they did do it together but it was one their song their concept their idea and the other three sort of played on it with wild enthusiasm or not as the case may be and it was a couple of people who said exactly the same thing who were there who went into the studio and saw this stuff going on and went oh yeah it was you know they it was you know uh, for the first time ever it was john lennon you know and the beatles or paul mccartney and the beatles as a backing band rather than four of them so i think it was a combination of both but unquestionably it was the time when they started to, yeah, you know, str- uh, to push forward their own identity, their own ide- ideas, um, and, and rightly so. Um, you know, they were, as I say, they were, you know, they were grown adults. They weren't the, the mop top Fab Four anymore. They all had musical ideas and they had great musical ability. So it was, un- you know, it was, it was, it was no surprise that they were going to do this. It was just that it was. A difficult time for them you know brian epstein had died uh, who knows what involvement or 
Brian Epstein might have had on this album or guiding them towards anything at all. I don't know. He may have had little or none. It may have well been that they were now out of his reach and control because they had were, you know, grown up searching to do something. Um, but unquestionably, you know, the, 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 I think when, when I interviewed Paul way back for an Abbey Road book I did in, in the 80s, you know, it, we, you know, he was saying that it was... It was a sort of weird album because, you know, the the Beatles recording sessions in Abbey Road were highly secretive affairs. You know, you were invited in and that's the only way you got in. Um, other people in the studio, you could sort of go up from EMI and go, hi, I'll just pop in to see Clifford. And you would, you know, be welcomed in. But the Beatles were it was all private and secretive. But, you know, Lennon said, my company said, you know, we, we were now running business meetings. You know, we had no manager. Uh, we were signing contracts, we were signing bits of paper, we were reading contracts, <laughs> you know, in the middle of making a record, which was something that they'd never done before. So I think, you know, it was it was a record made in very odd circumstances for them. Um, and I think there's a bit of both. I think unquestionably, you know, there were whole areas of it that they chose to create themselves before going to the finished product, and there were other parts of it that were... Um, much more of a of, of of group of group work, but I think it it, it certainly was the you know uh, uh, a time when they were you know spreading their wings and seeking to do something, um, and you know George got more songs than ever before. Ringo got a song, um, um, which is possibly why it ends up being a double album. You know, we all know George thought it should have been a, George Martin thought it should have been one great single album as opposed to a you know a, a, an average double album um but if they've gotten all the if they've got all these songs and they're all fighting for you know to find their place in this you know in this new sort of creative force that you can understand why it ended up being what it was perhaps Mm -hmm. In the part of the book where you have all the quotes from all the people, you know, people that worked on it and everything, mm. I, I, I notice that there's a lot of diversity of opinion. I mean, I don't have it open to, to that page here in front of me, but I, I believe it was Jeff Emmerich that said he didn't think it was a great album, and and mm. and and John said it's you know it's really it was better because I was being myself. That I mean that that's kind of weird that there's so much diversity of opinion. Why? Well, remembering well, yeah, yeah, one's got to remember that one was a performer and one was an engineer. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you know the 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 creative force says you know there's very few of us who would have made John Lennon's version of Revolution at the end of the album certainly um but and an engineer would probably have decided that you know she should probably cut it off after after two and a half minutes or something which is what we all do anyway mm -hmm. but i think there's always a there's always a difference between what is a creative force as a composer and performer than the 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 studio technician the engineer or whatever because by this time and you know george and ken Townsend, you know uh, said, you know, you were, these guys now knew what they were doing. You know, the, the 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 laughable quote that says, you know, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. But no, I mean, certainly, these guys now knew what the knobs and levers were doing, and they knew how to get what they wanted to get. Uh, it had taken some while to get there. Um, you know, Jeff Emmerich is, you know, sadly no longer with us. You know, having gone fairly recently. Um, but you know, he was. Uh, there's a lot of issues that went down with, with, with Jeff and the Beatles and EMI and Abbey Road. Uh, you know, there's a piece in the book where I think, you know, I quote Ken Townsend as, as you know, the, the letter that he saw of Jeff explaining that he why he walked out on the White Album sessions, you know, which was, you know, to paraphrase, that he hadn't got the credit that he thought he should deserve for his work with the Beatles. Um, that was written in a, in a resignation letter, but... At the, at the time, has also been, you know, back then was quoted as saying that, you know, it was a horrible album to work on and they were all getting on at each other and it was pretty miserable and I wasn't happy with it, so I decided to leave. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the truth was? I mean, there's a, you know, a lot of contention over some things in Jeff's book that George Martin didn't agree with and I know that Ken didn't agree with. Um, and it's, it's difficult to remember, but I, I have no... I have no problem with, with an engineer or a producer having a different view about how a record should be made or sound than, than the artist, which is the perfect example being, you know, what George Martin did to create the Beatles' earlier records. 
you know, without him, they would have been completely different, much rougher uh, and much less rounded for not having George's contribution to say, can we do this or maybe do that? And, you know, we're doing string arrangements or, you know, um, that's what a producer can contribute. Uh, and the artist will either go, yeah, that's, that's right, that's the way I like it, that's fine, I'm happy with that, or... No, I don't. That's not what I intended it to be. I don't want to go with that particular tape. Let's go and run with something else. You know, I mean, we got to that point, of course, with Phil Spector and Paul McCartney and the Let It Be album. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, producers will have different producers and engineers will have different ears, occasionally to the artist or the composer or the creator, uh, and that that doesn't surprise me at all. And and I think Alan Parsons, again, you know, a, a producer and a performer, interesting enough, who you know, he said to me that. You know, it's an album that contains some of his favourite Beatles songs and some of his least favourite Beatles songs ever. Um, you know, it is an album that that does 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 split split views. You know, I I know musicians who go, no, no, in the book, you know, Steve Harley, who means nothing in America, but here was a was a major artist going, no, no, you know, it's the worst album. It's it's no, not it's my least favourite album, etc. And I argue it's probably. Apart from Let It Be, and without question Yellow Submarine, which we won't get into, but it's probably my least favourite album too, you know. Um, and as I explained in the book, that's possibly because of the circumstances that I heard it in, was that I left home for the first time to go and be a, 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 a journalist in, in a, on a paper, you know, 50, 60 miles from where I lived. So I had to have a flat, and in, oh, it was a, a room, a bed -seat flat in a house. Uh, which I rented, uh, and while I had a radio, I didn't have a record player, because the record player was at home, in my parents' house. Mm -hmm. So in every circumstance up to that, when a Beatles record came out, you bought it, you put it on the record player until your father came and smacked you and told you to turn it off or something. Um, but this was the first one I didn't have at the time, which is why I don't have a numbered version, because I didn't actually rush out and buy it, because I was not in the circumstances. I was now forging a new career as a, as a sort of journalist, away from home, I was a sports journalist covering football matches and cricket and whatever, you know, out and about, and because I lived alone in a flat, I was volunteering to cover everything and anything, just because it was just better than being stuck alone. Um, so it was not, a, and, the, and because there was no single of it, you know, it wasn't being played on the radio that I did have, because, you know, radio stations, they were playing some of the tracks late at night, etc., but it wasn't daytime pop radio. So, in that respect, it was an album that sort of passed me what passed me by for a while. And it wasn't, you know, I then got married uh, the following year, 69, 70, uh, and we got a record player, and then you sort of caught up with a few things and went, oh, well, you know, that's, okay, that's fine. So, you know, it, it, it was an album that at the time I didn't appreciate. And I still take the sort of Alan Parsons view that there are some cracking tracks on there and there are some things that I never want to play again. <laughs> 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 okay. You know. <laughs> um, what songs? What songs do you think are the most significant, or uh, I guess, or, or even uh, what's your favorites? Oh, you know, you you've got to say the back in the USSR is a cracking, you know, rock song. I mean, you know, if you're ever going to have a single, and I, you know, that that was the record that should have been the single, and every record company of EMI around the world went, oh, great, that can be the first single then. And of course, and it wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and they, you know, in some cases, in around the world, with certain bands, you could take a single off a record and not tell the band because it was too far away for them to know. Uh, but you certainly didn't do that with the Beatles. So you know, I think "Back in the USSR" is is is, is a great, great rock and roll song. Um, uh, "Blackbird," you know, I mean, it's a beautiful song. It's it's up there with 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 "Yesterday" from that wonderful Paul's ability to write. You know. As an artist said to me once, you know, he writes the, some of the greatest melodies you'll ever hear and some of the worst words, mm -hmm. lyrics you'll ever hear, but that's another story. While My Guitar Gently Weeps is just an extraordinary piece of musicianship from, from George, which you love. And my, why are my particular favourite is actually rock, I love Rocky Raccoon, and I love Richie Haven's version of Rocky Raccoon. I think it's one of the great cover versions of Beatles songs ever. Um, and then there's other things that you sort of look at, really, you know, Honey Pie, I, I, you know, be on Revolution, you know, and some of the stuff that I, I think Helder Skelter was a great rock and roll track. It's slightly disturbing, but it's a great song. Uh, you know, Happiness is a Warm Gun, Savoy Truffle. There's things in there that you went, and Oblady Oblada, which is, you know, just a sort of 
catchy pop song that you know somebody had a number one record with. But it's you know you can't imagine that Mr. Lennon was a fan of Obladi Oblada. Mm -hmm. Let me ask about a, about a couple of the tracks. Um, yeah. First of all, um, being that you had so much um, association with Abbey Road, you mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard the acoustic version of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Um, it was one of the tracks that we wanted to put on the Sessions album that we wanted to issue back in the, oh, I don't know, mid-80s, I suppose, um, and we were not allowed to do so. Um, and part of the uh, injunction that the Beatles brought against us, it centred sent on a couple of issues, one of which, one of the songs that we wanted to do had a fourth uh, songwriting credit, uh, which was Ringo Starr. Mm -hmm. uh, and he refused to give permission for his company, Starling Music, to allow this to be released commercially. Um, so that was okay. That, that, was would, that um, would be Don't Pass Me By, right? Um, I'm trying to think what it was. No, no, it, no, he, no, he has a credit on... Um, oh, uh, what's the new Mary Jane? Oh, okay, and then actually I was going to ask about that anyway. Um, but yeah, but he, has, he, has a, he has a credit on that. And because we had a deal with Harris Songs and we had a deal with Northern Songs and so on and so forth, but, start, but it wasn't the deal. So he ref he was able to refuse permission for that to be released uh, as a commercial enterprise because he had a, he, we needed his consent as a fourth composer. What did you think of that acoustic version of While My Guitar Gently Well, that so was the one that was coming to because that was one of the other issues about it, that George was adamant that he was that was never intended for release. It was not a commercial recording. Hmm. It was a guide track. For, for Eric, um, and in those circumstances, I had some sympathy for George. I mean, I worked at EMI, and we were trying to put this record out for, because we thought, you know, it was before the anthologies, it was before the BBC stuff, and there was various bootlegs hanging around. And we just thought, you know, we, we, we invited the Beatles to be part of the process of, of, of choosing the tracks, and you know, getting Jeff or George to do what they wanted to do with them. You know, we tried to involve them as much as we could, but they they didn't they didn't uh, didn't want to go along with it. Um, but he was adamant that that was not a version that he ever intended for commercial release for really? people to hear. And I, you know, you have to respect that. I, it, it is fascinating to hear it, uh, and uh, and you can see, you know, what he wanted Eric to do and how he wanted Eric to do it, etc. Um, but um, I suppose, you know, you, you, you write and I write and it's a bit like taking, you know, your first draft <laughs> before you, you know, before you do the 15th finished version for publication. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, do, do you want people to see the first draft or the second draft? Do you want people to see the finished work? You know, there is a historical fascination with, you know, this is what Shakespeare wrote before he finished Hamlet, and it's his early version. You go, oh, that's, you know. But, you know, the, the, some, one has to give some respect to the uh, the creator to say, I didn't intend you to see that. Uh, and you go, okay, I get that. So I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a fascinating thing to hear, and it was a joy to hear, but I, I do have, I did have a lot of some sympathy with George at the time, that... Um, he had a perfect right to say, you know, I didn't intend that for you to hear it. I intended that for Eric Clapton to hear it. Um, okay, how about, you mentioned What's the New Mary Jane, which I, I mean, I remember hearing the, the bootlegs of that, and I loved it. I thought it was a, a fascinating yeah. track, and I thought it really kind of um, showed John's creativity. Um, what, did, what did you think of that? Song. I think it's a great track. I, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, you know, what's the? You know, it would probably have not got past the BBC censors, and it's. Uh, su you know, the, the suggesting that Mary Jane was marijuana, uh, <laughs> and any other any other radio station that might twig. I, I, no secret about it. No, it's one of those that I could have put it on the White Album and taken you know any one of a couple of tracks off, um, but. I wasn't there, and I wasn't asked. So yeah, that that it is better than some of you know some of the tracks that are on on the album. And um, who knows why they chose what they chose? And maybe I, I haven't done the count up, but maybe it was you know another Lennon song and not a McCartney song, or you know upset the balance. I don't know. Um, but it's sort of you know 
I, I'm, you know, everything, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey might have taken, gone into the bin for me, but that's, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, what we found when, when John Barrett did his exercise was that, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't that much that they threw away. You know, there wasn't that much that they that they threw away. I mean, there were songs like you know, it's only a northern song, which eventually ended up, you know, b b making it after being dropped a couple of times. Um, there wasn't. I, I, I who knows what they got at home. You know, we uh, that uh, that they had started, not finished, or you know, they were prolific writers. But you know, they were. They le they released a lot of records too. Uh, right, right, <laughs> they, right. They wrote a lot of songs, but they made a lot of records, and they got to put on. And I don't know how many spare things they had in mind or, or left over. I mean, I know John Barrett when he went through the stuff. It, there wasn't that much, you know. We we found the stuff for the um, uh, the, the the sessions album, you know. And there's about you know there's about I think twelve. Ten or twelve tracks. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't um, remember how exactly how many there are. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there weren't, there weren't that many. You said, right. you know, there weren't hundreds to choose from. It was and the stuff with the demo one after nine and nine and all that stuff that was on the you know the Bissemi Mucho and all that stuff that was from the early uh, or you know audition tapes etc. But there wasn't that. I don't think they wasted. I don't think they wasted that much. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't think they 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 they, they wrote not to order. Uh, although Lennon once, I think McCartney once said, you know, we've just written another swimming pool. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, you know, they, they it, it, it was difficult to be more prolific than they were at the time. You know, you, you talk to people now and it's it's interesting to explain to, to people now who are, who wait, you know, three years for the next album from whatever band it is. And you go, these guys are making two a year. <laughs> really? How about, you know, how about and, tour, and touring and doing you know world touring the world and doing TV shows and Christmas specials and promotion and right and making two albums a year and you go that you know they, their workload was extraordinary right it was you know, I mean I've just watched the Ron Howard thing all last year the eight days a week and you do get you do get some feeling in that of of the pressure that was upon them and and was put upon them and how they had to try and survive this thing and you can see why it all ended in 1966 from you know being on the road as you went. We can't do this anymore, boys. You know, mm -hmm. We cannot carry on doing this. Um, and they, you know, they've probably got little or no sympathy from EMI as a record company because you know you're out there milking it. Uh, you, you know, you right. sort they of were, think you they, sort of think you've only got one crack at this. Right. You know, no they one were making, assumed that. Well, no one assumed they'd still be selling records fifty years later. <laughs> right. And they were making tons of money for EMI yeah. at the time. Yeah. So. And that's what EMI did as a public company. It had shareholders. It had directors. That was its job. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly wasn't going to go to the Beatles and say, "Okay, guys, you can have a year off. Don't make a record." Right. Uh, you know, they chose when they. Uh, by the time they got to the stage of sort of Revolver and and well, you know, maybe the one before, maybe Rose sort of Revolver, so but they were calling the shots. Mm -hmm. You know, they had got to the stage of saying, "We're going to go." You know, Abbey Road changed its entirely entire recording times because the Beatles wanted to go in and could only go in and record at night because they were being put under so much pressure to do other things like concert tours and TV shows and, you know, you, whatever. I mean, prior to that, Abbey Road had, you know, very strict three-hour sessions. Mm -hmm. You know, you started at 10, went through to 1 o'clock, then you came back at 2 o'clock until 5 o'clock, then you broke again for tea, and then you started at 7, then you finished at 10 o'clock at night, and that was the end of it. No one went past 10 o'clock at night. And the Beatles changed that. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they went, we've got to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning. You look at, you know, if you look at Mark's book, Mark Lewis's book, and you note the times when these people went in and when they finished, you know, that that's, you know, they went in at 7 o'clock at night and finished at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right. Uh, and that's, that Abbey Road had to change, and they changed it, because you couldn't ask them to be on the road, and, you know, you follow his, 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 logistics of their day you know they do a, they, they do a bbc broadcast in the morning they do a tv show in the afternoon then they go in the studio in the evening <laughs> yeah it was it was madness it, it was it was how about um another odd track uh, revolution hmm. number nine what and the and especially the evolu the evolution between you know all the different versions the slow version the rock the the rock and roll version and, the, and that. The, well the long version on the album i can i can live with that <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and the other two you know the 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 the, the b-side 
um, and the other album version. I, yeah, that's fascinating. That that's uh, that's uh, you know that's that's uh, interesting insights for it to uh, you can write a song uh, and then continue to do arrange it and perform it and play it in, in different ways. I, I think you know the the final bit evolution uh, nine. You you just think really okay. You know it's 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 a degree of madness and degree of. I can do this because I can, um, and you know I'll, I'll go off and do it for as long as I can. I can do it because no one's going to stop me. Um, um, but then the, the, the two sort of you know song versions, if you like, um, are quite you know they no they they both funny enough they both stand up um, in their own you know in their own right. They're both they're both um, yeah they're, they're, you know I'm not sure whether the album version would have. Uh, been as exciting as the B-side um, as the the one that they chose to put out as the B-side, which was a very you know it was a very up tempo, great it was a great rock song and you know um, but his his con- Lennon's constant you know count me in, count me out, count me in out was mm-hmm. <laughs> you know was maybe a sign of the times you know he was very conscious of revolution he was obviously very conscious of what was going on around him and was very conscious of being seen. You know, there was a man in London called Tarek Ali who was a, a, lead, a great student leader and a revolutionary and so on at the time, who was friends with Jagger and a few other people. And he was, you know, he was adamant that there should be revolution and there should be fighting on the streets and we should overturn this, that and the other. And I think Pope John was sort of, you know, he, 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 he took a step back and he was very conscious of who he was and was he going to be seen to be the leader of a revolution that he wasn't entirely convinced you know what, what do you mean my revolution are you just going to stand up and shout or are you actually going to have guns in the streets and are you actually going to have you know violence or are you just going to have a political revolution and i think he was you know in in that trying to work out can't be in can't be out can't be in at whatever was it was interesting that he yeah. You know, he stepped back and went you know i'm, I'm yeah i i could be to blame for this <laughs> It, mm. it all goes nasty, you know. Yeah, um, that's an that's an interesting thought, especially uh, when you look at the scene today. And every and people are always speculating what he would be like today had, if he was <laughs> if he was around. And you know, uh, over here, <laughs> over here they are. I don't know if they, if they're doing it in England, but they I are here. No, we don't. We don't. He would have mellowed. I mean, you know, all the people that I know who spent time with him at that time in the. Uh, I mean, he was the only one I never met and never had any involvement with because I worked at EMI on on their solo releases and compilations and, mm. things and had you know had more to do with Paul than the other two. But worked with George on a you know in fact was mistaken for George by my own managing director on one occasion, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, asking me how I was getting on without working without the other three. Um, I obviously, I obviously made an impression him as head of press of EMI, but still. Um, and Ringo just popped in now and again uh, and did what he did. No, I think he. Had, I mean, people. Everybody I spoke to who was there at the time was of the view that he was. He was not a nice man, John. Lennon. he was sarcastic. He was. He could be acidic in his humour, and, and you know, that's evident from some of the things that he, you know, he has been filmed and right. you know, there are there. He was. You know, he was short-tempered. He was impatient, etc. You know, and then maybe Yoko changed a lot of that. I don't know. You know, he then became, you know, a house husband and a, and a uh, fought for, for peace and, and, and American politics, you know, wanted to go along with the Jerry Rubens and the David Ox and those sort of people. So he was a changing face and maybe he would have become, I mean, what would he be now, 80, I suppose, wouldn't he? I don't know, 70, 1940, so whatever was that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously mellowed, we all do. Um, making music well, it seems he would never stop in the way that you know Paul continues to do so whether we want him to or not I think he'd have found other things to do rather than just music you know I think writing would have come to the fore with him a lot more you know he's very creative in terms of writing uh, I think that would have, have, have come to the fore um, he was also of course and I, I'm, I'm with him on this one I seemingly he was a man who was very good at doing nothing 
uh, and I admire that. I'm a great fan of doing nothing. <laughs> um, I, wa- I want to be Italian and, and sit on corners of, of streets and drink coffee and do nothing. And, you know, uh, people say he was very lazy. You know, he could be very, very lazy and quite happily do nothing. And you can, you know, there are times within the Sergeant Pepper and... Um, you know, he, he, interesting enough that, you know, the frustration that obviously came about being in India with the Maharishi, you mm-hmm. know, uh, while he could sit around and do nothing in, in, in Weybridge or wherever with the telly on and he got a recording studio that he could dibble or dabble about or, you know, when he fancied doing something or not doing something or he could go and watch the TV. But, you know, in India, he had nothing. And that wasn't doing nothing. That was complete boredom. You know, that was now the the idea of saying you're doing nothing for two and a half. And you're, I mean nothing. There's no telly. There's no newspapers. There's no, you know, there's no alcohol. There's no cigarettes. There's no. That, that's different to sitting in your in your lounge doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I gather he, you know, quite happily could be quite lazy and and and, and not do anything. He, you know, he'd have chosen new outlets for a hugely creative spirit. You know, that's indicative of most recording artists that have got any longevity, you know, is that they keep carrying on doing stuff. Maybe, you know, maybe they shouldn't. You know, the Eagles are back out there again after the 19th time. You know, members of Floyd are continuing to be Floyd in some way or another. You know, uh, Nick Mason's just gone on the road with a new band. Yeah, I, I, just, I, Floyd, just, I just heard uh, about know. that. just heard about yeah, that. Great, but, you know, that, 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 they, the Rolling Stones, you know, carrying on forever. Um... Paul McCartney's continues to do stuff. I think I think Ringo still puts his all stars together every now and again to do stuff. But they can do it in their own time. They can do it at their own convenience. But they don't do nothing. And mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't retire. You know that maybe some of them should. Um, I was going. Well, I was. I was actually going to ask you. Uh, what about Paul and Ringo? Uh, do you think they're? You think it's good that they're still out doing what they're doing? I haven't seen or heard Ringo for a while. So, you know, I mean, you know, he hasn't got the greatest... He's a very distinctive voice, if you mm-hmm. remember back to some... I mean, I'm, I'm, I can, Yellow Submarine I can live without ever hearing again. But, <laughs> you know, you take the tracks that they gave him on, on some of those albums and boys and stuff, he has a very distinctive vocal style. And he's one of... If you heard... Or if they play, if you played your record and said, who's that, you go Ringo. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of those voices that you go, good or bad, you go, that's Ringo. Yeah, I, I, you know, they're in, they're entitled to do it. Uh, obviously, they're entitled to put it out there for people to go and see or buy or whatever, and people will make a judgment as to whether they want to pay whatever they want to pay. I mean, I'm I worked with with Paul and Wings, you know, at that time throughout the eighties. I toured with them, you know. I saw, you know, too many gigs for my liking of all bands in those. You know, there comes you get into a sort of you know a gig blindness if you like. <laughs> Would I want to pay 150 bucks to see Paul McCartney today? I probably wouldn't. I've sort of taken an unwritten rule. I don't go and see anyone who's older than me. That includes the Rolling Stones and the Who. <laughs> Just because, you know, you saw them at their peak. Mm-hmm. And they're not at their peak anymore. You know, Paul's voice is, you know, we know has taken a sort of turn, you know, a downward curve. You know, and you, you sort of, you know, you're almost feeling for him. But you know, I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to say you shouldn't do it because that's his call. And people, mm-hmm. you know, whether they are people who bought the records and want to relive it, or whether they are people who you know want to see them, the legend that is Paul McCartney before it all ends. You know, that's fine. But, but you know, the, yeah, the sort of it's not necessarily from something I want to do. You know, okay. I just sort of sit there and think, do I want to go and see the Eagles again, having seen them in the seventies and the eighties? I don't know because some you know some of it's not going to sound great. There's a the falsetto bits and you know so but, you know it's or you know they're perfectly perfectly right to go and do it and let themselves if they want to do it you know fine um, and and there was always you know I'm 71 and I've decided never to write another book you know three times in the last four years <laughs> <laughs> and there I am doing another one and possibly doing another one next year so. You know, if someone rings you up and says, do you find... And you go, yeah, okay, that's quite interesting. So, you know, I, I can't be hypocritical and say no, but, you know, right. um, there'll come a point when I'll go, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, 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 can, I can understand that. The pictures in the book are great, and I'm yeah. wondering, are there any previously unpublished, and did you dig up some really... I mean, I, I, didn't, do the, I didn't do the picture research. Was, uh, the, the men at Carlton do the picture research and send, and send them to me. Mm-hmm. and go, can you identify this, can we caption this, where did it come from, and whatever else. I am 
thinking that there are probably very few, if any, unpublished photographs because they would normally deal with the 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 agencies of Getty and various other people of photographs that mm-hmm. are, are in are in those various libraries. The ones I tried to get were taken by um, Tony Bramwell, mm-hmm. uh, who I have I had a couple of his I think in the Sergeant Pepper book, and he took some in the on the White Album setting. But they were subsequently acquired. Uh, he licensed them to a to a, a library for their usage, and that library, that company, went into liquidation some years back. Uh, I don't think anyone sort of told Tony that it was going into liquidation, and the entire library of pictures, uh, certainly all the Beatles pictures, were bought by Apple. But that meant that they were not available for us to use, which was a pity, because he had taken some session, some photographs in, in the studio with, with, uh, with the band and the various people who were there, etc. So, um, now they send them, to, they, they come up with a whole bunch of pictures and send them to me and see if I can identify them and, and, and work out when and where they were taken and who, you know, I mean, I, you're, you're of a certain age and I'm of a certain age. We know now that everybody in a publishing company is 12 years of age. Uh, <laughs> and they've never seen Mal Evans or Neil Aspinall or, Jane Asher or whatever, so you sort of spend your life going, that's no, that's that, and that, you know, and doing that and that and that. So you do that, which is quite interesting. Um, and they sometimes get the names wrong. Uh, Alan yes. Parsons didn't end up. Uh, they sent me a picture of a. There's a British author who I used to who used to work on New Music Express actually when I was a, a press officer called Tony Parsons, who may mean nothing in America. He's he's written some very English novels and is quite successful. Um, who isn't Alan Parsons, but when, <laughs> when I got the picture spread, I went, that's not Alan Parsons, that's Tony Parsons. Mm. Uh, and the bloke at uh, Carlton, the only Parsons he's ever heard of, was Tony Parsons. <laughs> so we have to make sure that that didn't slip through. So no, they, they, they do all the picture research and then send them to me and I pick them out and, and then subsequently sort of caption them and go, no, that should go there or that should move there or that should go there. I mean, you know, that, that, that's of the Beatles and, and, and the ones to do with the, with the album. I, I also had to go and check through all the photographs with the new stuff because they got some of those wrong as well for support, which were oh, sixty-eight. Wow. But they were, well, you know, there was a there was a band, there was a bunch of um, protesters, demonstrators um, in uh, Germany called uh, the Ma- the Bader Meinhof gang, which you may or may not have heard of. I don't know <laughs> who were German, you know, uh, anarchists and stuff like that, and they they put a picture of them in the in the book, and then I had to identify that they didn't actually. Start up until 1970, and so it wasn't them. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, things like that, which you, which is you know, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, they're easy to make those sort of mistakes, but you have to, uh, you know, people still, I think people still pr- produce pictures of Paul McCartney as a right-handed bass player. I think probably somewhere that was always the great trick, wasn't it? That, you know, right, <laughs> right. You know, he's, uh, everyone assumed he was a right-handed bass player. Or many people who weren't involved in the music business on national newspapers or magazines that had no knowledge of music would just print a picture of him, you know, right-handed, fe- completely forgetting. But, yeah. Um, now, yeah. you've written how many Beatle books? I know you've done... You've done oh, too many. Too many. Too many. <laughs> Um, okay, let me have a look at what I've written. Um, well, I know the, Ab- the Abbey Road book. The well, Abbey Road isn't the Beatles, but it's right. Abbey Road. So it's, uh, the, it's history. The, it's the story of Abbey Road Studios. The Northern Songs book, which... Northern which, Songs is the Beatles. Um, right. I did a book called The Beatles in a Hundred Objects. Right. Um, and I did a book with Julian Lennon. Um, oh, yes, the Julian Lennon, the Julian Lennon Collection, book. which was his memorabilia, of his dad's mm-hmm. memorabilia. That we, did a, we did a book together about that. Uh, so that's three. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's four. The White Album's five. Uh, I think that's about it. Do you have any uh, other plans for another Beatle book? And I, I, I don't have one in mind personally. Okay. You know, the, we we're now into. If one wanted to do a book for nineteen sixty nine, two thousand and nineteen, one could do Abbey Road. As, a, as an album, in the same way as doing Sgt. Pepper and the White Album. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that that's... It, you know, I've thrown it into the pot with, with, with Carlton, who, you know, they didn't want to do the White Album until they saw how the Sgt. Pepper album did, and they probably won't want to do the next album until they see how this one... Yeah, I, you know, that's how they work. So, mm-hmm. 
I wanted to do a different album for 1969. I wanted to do Tommy. But Interesting. The, the, yeah, but see, it came out in March next okay. year, and I, can't, I couldn't do... I couldn't do the Wyatt album and get that out and also do research to do the Tommy album to get it delivered. It would have to be delivered now. Right. And come out next March. You know, you know the long the lead times they have. Mm -hmm. So that, that didn't sort of work. Uh, 69 would be Abbey Road, but I don't know because uh, it's in, it's there. I've thrown it in. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. Uh, 1970, if one continued with the same series, one could do uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water because they don't have to be Beatles records. So I don't have anything in mind at the moment. Um, but you might. But you might do Abbey Road. Might. Well, I, no. I it, well, I, I would be prepared to do it, but I'm not. It's not my decision. I would like to do it with them. They do make. They do produce a lovely book. Mm -hmm. You know, their 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 design, their artwork. You know, that it's their concept as much as mine. So if we were going to do it, you know, I wouldn't want to, and I don't suppose anyone could nick the idea because they probably copyrighted it anyway. So that you know, it, it, it's it's just it's there. It's it's you know, it's something I've thrown into Carlton, you know, earlier this year just to say okay, because um, the White Album wasn't on my uh, wasn't on my horizon at all. Right. It, 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 you know, my white my album was okay. Do Sergeant Pepper. We're going to do, you know, I'd, I'd like to start working this year, 60, in, in 2018, to do the Tommy album for 69, whatever, and then we go on from there. But then they came back from various book festivals and things that one goes, oh, you know, we, Sgt. Pepper was pretty successful, people liked it, should we do the White Album? I went, okay, interesting. Not my favourite album, as we know, but that doesn't mean to say it's not a great story. You know, it's it's a fascinating album, in that it does signal the end of the Beatles in many ways it does right. sort of split people's opinions you know as to how good or how bad it was um, and it was an interesting year in terms of uh, what went on around the world in 1968 so it, you know it sort of all made sense you know they haven't got to be my favourite records in any way whatsoever right um, so this one came into the into the horizon you know into the melting pot and, and we finished it so right now I, I'm doing something else for another publisher, which isn't my book. It's somebody else's book about another artist that I've worked with, and they've asked me to contribute some an essay or so to that particular book, along with five or six other people who's, who are going to be contributing significant essays, apparently, to this thing, which isn't the Beatles. So I'm sort of about to start on that because I've got to deliver that in January or February, I think. Um, by which time, you know, they'll have some idea about the success or not of this of the White Album, and then we can have a conversation about, you know, is there a follow-up, is there another one, or do I finally get to retire? So I'll play the White Album a few more times, because I'm, 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 I'm sort of half putting it down to me, thinking, you know, is it is it is it that bad? Is it that good? Is it, you know, for people to tell me it's the best Beatles album of all time, I, I don't get that at all. I don't think it's the worst Beatles album of all time. I, I've sort of played it while I was writing the book, but I haven't actually sort of sat down and listened to 30 tracks in quick succession. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's, it, it's, I, might have to, um, I might have to go back and enjoy it again or try and appreciate it again. Thanks to Brian Southall for taking the time to do that interview. His book, The White Album Revolution Politics and Recording the Beatles and the World in 1968, is available through links on our Beatles News and Information page and our That's What I Want Beatles store, both on Facebook. Okay, going back in history on November 22nd, 1968, the White Album, speaking of the White Album, was released in the UK. It was released three days later in the US. On November 24th, 1962, Paul McCartney in Record Mirror rec reminisced about playing the Cavern. He said, We love the Cavern. Surprisingly enough, groups from outside Liverpool don't like it. It's small and cramped, but we're at home there. We play the frantic beat numbers and the R&B stuff, like Some Other Guy and If You've Got to Make a Fool of Somebody. Thanks to Brian Southall. Thanks to you for listening. You can hear the show in back-to-back -back blocks on the great Fab Four Radio, for which we thank Matt Burley. And you can hear the show individually on YouTube or Podbean or iTunes or Google Play or wherever you get podcasts. Send your comments to BeatlesNewsDesk at gmail.com or leave them on YouTube or iTunes. Please join our Beatles News and Information group on Facebook where we post news and links to Beatles stuff as, uh, as it happens. And also take a look at our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook. 
for links to just released Beatles stuff that you might be interested in. And please subscribe to this show wherever you get it. Rate us on iTunes, please. And take a second to share our episodes from wherever you get them so we can feel the love. We would really, really appreciate that. Until next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying we hope you had a happy and healthy and safe Thanksgiving. And as Patrick McGowan used to say on The Prisoner, which was one of our all-time favorite shows, Be seeing you. that one market fab <laughs>